Recently, federal courts have been giving uh, what are called nationwide injunctions or universal injunctions or national injunctions. The idea is that it's an injunction that's much broader than the ordinary injunction. And what makes it broader is not geographic scope. It's not that it's bigger in terms of places, as if it ran all through the country. What makes it different is that it applies to people who are not parties, that it protects non-parties. Do federal courts have the authority to give national injunctions? That's a controversial question right now. The question is what the judicial power is and what role is imagined by that grant of power by the Constitution. Article three of the US Constitution gives federal judges the judicial power. That's a power to decide cases and controversies between the parties. The critics and supporters of the national injunction disagree about the implication of Article III for the injunction. For critics of the national injunction, the, the national injunction is flatly inconsistent with Article III because what judges are doing is going beyond their traditional role to decide a case. Instead, they're setting policy for the entire country. Federal courts are supposed to decide cases. They give remedies in those cases. And part of their job is that they aren't supposed to be deciding political issues for non-parties. Their power and their constraint is in the case. Sometimes it will be the case when an injunction protects the plaintiff, that there will be an inevitable spillover effect on other people. But the court's authority is only concerned with the parties to the case. The best argument for the national injunction is that the court has identified something that is unconstitutional or illegal. And what the court has identified that is unconstitutional or illegal is not specific to the plaintiff. It's often called a facial challenge. So if the plaintiff is bringing a facial challenge to the statute or rule as a whole, and the plaintiff wins, then the remedy should match the scope of the wrong. That's the best argument for the national injunction, and it's persuaded many people. The national injunction didn't start picking up until the 1970s, and then the national injunction goes along from the 1970s until the, near the end of the Obama administration. Republican state attorneys general sue the Obama administration and stop major parts of the Obama administration's program through national injunctions. Now, Democratic state attorneys general are doing the same thing against the Trump administration. One recent development is a request by the state of Texas for a national injunction to stop the administration from continuing to maintain the DACA program. What's interesting about that national injunction is it would be directly contrary to a national injunction from the court in the Northern District of California. That sets up the possibility of conflicting injunctions, which is a kind of nightmare scenario for the national injunction because both injunctions could be enforced with contempt. And you might think at that point that there's no harm done because we're getting a national decision from the Supreme Court. But what the national injunction will have done is put the Supreme Court in a very bad decision-making posture because it will be deciding major statutory and maybe constitutional questions in a very rushed emergency posture. There won't be a trial to build a record and so it'll all happen very quickly. Not a good recipe for judicial decision making. Our system is set up for judges to decide particular cases and then slowly but surely, as precedents develop, we get an answer to the question. It's a little messy, it takes a little time, but we hope to get better answers this way. That entire process is short-circuited by the national injunction.